Daniel, for the introduction. Thanks everyone for joining the, the talk today. As Daniel said today, I'm not chairing the, the meeting, but I am on the other side presenting. Uh, a bit more scary, <laughs> but but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also excited to be presenting this, this method. That, as Daniel said, the, uh, these are some methods that I, um, I started to be interested in like long time ago, actually, because it was when I was a math student uh, that I discovered the uh, topology. And I really was very interested in trying to apply topology, but for that moment was, uh, was quite, quite difficult because it was a very, very abstract uh, field of math. And, and there was not uh, many applications to work on or to get to apply topology to. And, and even it was a quite a weird thing to be interested in because uh, there was the, this uh, standing um, joke about what is a topology. I don't know if you, if you have ever heard about it, but many people say, oh, what a topology is someone who cannot uh, distinguish between a donut and a coffee cup. Uh, and, and this is why, if you can see the slide now, you should be seeing a slide with uh, all of uh, couple, co coffee cups and uh, leading to a donut. Is, is that the case, uh, Hannah? Sorry, yes, it's fine. Okay, I'm just checking that the slides are moving. Okay, okay. So um, this is because uh, in topology, figures that can be uh, deformed, that can be transformed one in another, following just uh, continuous deformations uh, under the perspective of topology are uh, considered to be um, equivalent. And so if you took, if you take, a, you imagine that the coffee cup is made of clay, for example, you can deform it to be a donut using them, what are known as like continuous deformations. So. Sorry. So this is leading us to, to do, I mean, to do a, a very, very brief introduction to topology. And topology is uh, what I said is basically focusing on um, qualitative shape properties that are preserved through continuous deformations, like can be, for example, twisting or stretching of objects. Uh, for example, non-continuous de deformations would be cutting or gluing. That are examples of deformations that would change what is called the topology of an object. In other words, uh, topology is this field of mathematics that they can track the underlying qualitative structure that uh, can define the essence of, of an object. So for example, if we take a sphere and, and we stretch a clay to form an ellipsoid, uh, its relative position would not change, nor it will change the fact that uh, there's a big hole in the inside of the sphere and the ellipsoid. So we will say, a topologist would say that an ellipsoid and a an sphere are topological equivalents. There are more, more concepts of a topology that are important to retain for the next for, for the whole of the talk, and because they are the main actually three concepts of topology. The first one is coordinate invariance. So in topology, the properties of shapes that are measured will not change if we change the coordinate. So this means that if we rotate the shape in uh, different certain coordinate systems, we won't change the properties that topology describes for a, for a shape. Also, uh, another a second property that is uh, meaning in topology is what is called the deformation invariance. This is what I just introduced, that the shape can be stretched, can be squashed, as long as the features, the topological features are kept. And the third one that we will see in depth during the presentation is what is called the compressed representation. So through topology, the pieces of shape can be compressed into single points that can be shown with different connections and that this can be represented in different plots that can help us understanding the data uh, without having to retain all the big, uh, the big shape, but only retaining the most essential features. You will see all of this in practice in a moment. But I was talking about topology, but this talk is about topological data analysis. Well, who was uh, in charge of adding the word data to the field? Well, he was uh, the emeritus professor Gunnar Kelson. He belonged to the math department at the Stanford University. Maybe you may you may know him. So he has visited uh, the UK many times, and he has given brilliant presentations on topological data analysis. I could join a few of them. He is very approachable, very nice person. And and in words of of Gunnar, uh, TDA is based on the principle that data has shape 
and shape has a meaning and that this meaning can drive values. Let's see what kind of values uh, this um, shape of data can, can drive. I'm going to highlight four works that have been published very, very recently. I would say that um, the application of topological data analysis to um, health data and to precision medicine studies has had an explosion during the last two to three years. And the first uh, work I'd like to, to highlight to start uh, the, the talk with is this one that, this one that was uh, published in 2020 in BMC Bioinformatics. And then the authors were developing a topological data analysis based classification method to analyze multiple measurements. So the motivation uh, for the authors to do this work uh, was starting by concepting that machine learning models for repeated measurements are limited and authors developed a modified mapper network we will see what is a mapper network. This is a topological tool later on. And they combined this mapper network with the machine learning model. And then uh, they tested this uh, method, this novel method on three cases studies. And they compared it against an alternative support vector machine voting model. And in most situations tested, authors could see like the mapper plus the machine learning model uh, in combination uh, was exceeding in accuracy, the most standard approach. A second work was uh, published in Artificial Intelligence in Medicine, also in 2020, and authors were using topological data analysis and still the time series to infer temporal phenotypes from electronic health records. Uh, you may know that temporal models are very interesting as they can capture change in disease over time and this can be very helpful to identify key features that can uh, describe and that can profile the disease subtype uh, that can underpin the disease, the different disease trajectories. So these uh, people to, 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 to run this analysis also explored the mapper uh, topological data analysis tool and they were using it to build temporal phenotypes. Then they applied the model uh, to a type to diabetes data set and they could uh, show that this uh, data analysis was able to identify uh, the disease trajectories they were, they were looking for. A third study was published in, also in 2020 in Algorithms for Computational Biology, also using topological data analysis. In this case, to predict phenotypes from gene expression data. And in this case, authors were not relying on the mapper graph, but in what we also video, I will be introducing as well in this talk, the persistent homology. So authors observed that standard machine learning methods alone and perform somewhat poorly as authors and also other people working in machine learning have, have uh, realized as well. And, and could see that the, the, gene, the gene expression that was poorly performing in predicting um, disease uh, status or patent control using gene expression. And so they used this for this best method, as I've said, based on persistent homology, and uh, basically they um, compared, sorry, uh, against other, well, well, they applied the method in data from the Parkinson, Park, uh, Parkinson disease uh, study of case and control. And they also uh, measured this against other standard machine learning methods. And they found that the method they were using based on TDA was uh, also improving results in comparison with the rest of, of, of algorithms. And the fourth and last study, I will be also talking in more detail later in, in this talk, is this one where um, authors were using multidimensional topological data analysis to identify traits of hip osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis OA is a multifactorial disease. Uh, it has many variables affecting diagnosis and progression. And authors here wanted to identify um, biomarkers that can classify different disease progression phenotypes. And they use it again, mapper, and this tool was able to propose new phenotypes not discovered before. So what I'm going to be presenting you, so after seeing that the, it seems that the topological data analysis can be helpful uh, to analyze a uh, kind of data sets like the ones I have just uh, introduced, I'm going to be providing an overview of topological data analysis to study data sets in precision medicine. So that talk is going to be um, mainly methodological. 
it's not that we don't have applied work on that, of course we do. Uh, so with my team, we have um, different applications, ongoing work at the moment, but we really found uh, that, and we were discussing this before with, with the team, with Ewan and Yi Yang, and, and, and we found that it was very, very challenging to introduce all the methods we were working on plus all the, the clinical problem and the results we, we are getting. And so we decided to split things and that I will be today uh, introducing the methods and the most theoretical part. I will briefly connect with our own research and then later in the year, I hope that in March, in March if it's possible, but next in, for sure, not after the spring, we will be um, also presenting in this uh, series of seminars. And um, I post that we will be presenting the, the results of, of the application of these developments on TDA. So I will be presenting mainly two techniques from TDA the persistent homology and the mapper graph. And I will also discuss how these techniques uh, can be effective and uh, basically based upon the literature of the ABAL, where the methods have been applied and methods that have been applied in comparison or in combination or in addition to machine learning. This is why the talk has been told it's been, it's been called Augmentating Machine Learning with Topological Data Analysis. And as I said, I will also uh, briefly connect the concept with uh, our ongoing work. So to understand a little bit what uh, kind of extra information can topological data analysis uh, provide to our uh, um, data analysis. Uh, let's start by looking at a very, at a very, very, very simple example. So you can see the data in the left-hand float, uh, where you can see there are uh, four clusters, and they are different clusters, but they seem to be quite um, related, or so they are sharing some points across the a continuum. Uh, we can see also there is a trend between the four clusters. There is one cluster that are occupying a lot, the lower part of the graph, and then there are the second and three and the fourth. There is like like increasing a uh, trend between them. Uh, so well, you have the, this data. You can uh, consider, for example, to fit a linear regression as we are doing in the in the first chart in the chart A. But you could also consider to fit a topological model. Uh, you could use Mapper, which is a network graph model. And in this very, very simple mapper graph, each node is representing one cluster of our data. The fact that the clusters are connecting are, is telling us that these clusters are sharing observations and that they are colored with showing some information in this case. And the, all the colors are showing low to high values for different um, variables in the axis. So, for example, the color scale from blue to red uh, is this increasing value for the variable in the x-axis for the central plot, and the same colors because the increase is the same is showing in the plot C uh, how the how the, the three clusters the variable the, the variables in, in the y-axis is increasing along the three the three axes uh, the, the y-axis along the four clusters. So, sorry. So this is quite simple way of um, of visualizing the same data, so through using a linear regression or a topological model. But of course, data shapes, shape data shapes can be much more fancy, and especially when we move to higher dimensions. So imagine you, uh, you can see a sample of your data set. Many times we can't do that because our very high dimension does not allow us to do so. But let's imagine you are in R3 and we can see our data. You plot your data and you get a figure like that. So, okay, this is quite similar to a donut, you would agree with me. Uh, so this is similar to what is called in, in, in geometry, uh, the figure that is called a torus. Um, okay, what can we do with that? So with the fact that our sample might be drawn from a torus uh, surface. Well, let's consider that actually. Let's consider that our sample Xn have been drawn from uh, the support, the compact, I need to say this so that all the rest of the theory will work. But this is a mathematical notion. Don't worry about that now. But this sample has been drawn from the compact support M of a probability function M nu. That is basically a torus. So my sample has been drawn from, a, from the shape of a torus. And if I look at the torus now, and I forget for a moment about my sample, I can describe a torus, for example, like a shape that is having what is called one connected component. A connected component is actually a piece. So my torus is having 
one piece, right? I don't have two torus, two separated pieces. I just got one piece. So this is that my shape is having showing one connected component. There are no breaks in the surface. Then I do have two circular holes. These are, these are the two red ones that you can see in the image. And these balls are used to generate the torus. So because you can start by this one, the big one around the big hole, and then if you take the second one and you move that one across the other red circle, and you put a, a little bit of paint here, you'll be able to draw all the torus, given that you have these two circles. And also, you can describe the torus as having one void in the inside, one bubble here. So this kind of information is the system that topologists use to track what are called the topological features in, uh, in an object, in a topological space. And uh, these are the kind of information that they use to classify and compare objects. The field, uh, the theory uh, within the, 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 the area of, of topology that um, in, in, in some way formalize all of this that I am explaining is what is called the theory of homology. And I will formally introduce it a little bit uh, later, later in the talk. But uh, the, the general idea is this one. So this is the kind of information we are, we are having. How we are going to move this to our data set? Because we don't have shapes, we don't have a torus, we have a sample of our data. So this is what TDA does actually, is connecting our data with, to, to, so that we are able to get to infer this kind of information, but from a data set. What we need to do this is to have a points cloud of data equipped with a metric, and then we won't be able to do this directly to in, in our data. We won't be able to uh, sample our data, draw the data, and see, oh, I have a hole, oh, I have a, a circle, or I have a void. We would need something else. We would need to build a continuum shape on top of the points cloud. And this is normally done by means of a kind of graph. I'm going to call it graph, but it's not always graph, uh, because the kind of constructions that we will consider on top of the points cloud uh, can be even of more dimensions. Graphs are normally two-dimensional graphs, and, and these graphs are a kind of generalization, as they can have uh, blocks or higher dimensions. But they are kind of graphs, so I think it's, it, it's good to mention it like that, to trigger intuition. So first, what I'm going to be doing is just one slide I will introduce formally what is homology. And second, I will show you a couple of ways of how to build graphs on the, on the top of points class using mapper and the persistent homology. Okay, so homology, more formally. Uh, homology is one of the, I would say, the central concepts that, uh, in, in, that belongs to topology and that is used in TDA, heavily used in TDA. And homology is a field, that is, is a concept that is focusing on counting and classifying holes within a given object, holes of any dimension. A hole of dimension zero is a connected component. A hole of dimension one is a cycle. A hole in dimension two is a cavity, it's a void, and so on. I cannot imagine what is a hole in n dimensions. And homology is a, a classical concept in algebraic topology. Uh, so it provides a, it's a very powerful tool to formalize the, handle the notion of, of topological feature and in any topological space in an algebraic way. And so um, for any dimension k, the k-dimensional features will be represented by a vector space that is called hk. And the rank of this vector space intuitively is going to be the number of such independent features. Okay, what I'm saying. So the zero-dimensional homology group, this vector space, represents the space of the connected components of my figure. So for example, uh, in the case of the terrace, H0, okay, was the one piece, all the piece, one connected component. And the rank, what is called the Betty number, for H0 was one, because I was having for the torus one connected component. The one-dimensional homology group is going to be the same, but for the one-dimensional loops, these are cycles. So every time I see a cycle, this is one element from my H1 group. Okay? For H2 is the same, and so on until Hn. 
We can see an example here for different figures. The petty numbers are the rank for each of the, of the topological features. So beta zero, number of connected components. For a DAT, it's just one piece, so I just have one connected component. So Betty number is one. For a cycle, I just have one piece, isn't it? So the dimension is again one because it's just one connected component. For the sphere, the same. For the torus, the same. Here, beta one, this is the space of circles. A point has no circle. Oh, a circle has one circle, exactly. A sphere has no circle, is zero. And for the torus, we'll have two circles. For beta two is, is, is the voids. So we have only voids in the inside of the sphere, and we do have one void in the whole of the of the torus. It might not seem intuitive, this, but after a while of, of experience a little bit of this and train yourself a little bit of this, then you are able to see that. But anyway, it's not necessary that you identify this yourself because, of course, we have softwares that do that automatically. But these are the kind of topological descriptors that will be used to describe data. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more about this homology, let's focus now on understanding what is the kind of continuum shape that we are going to be building on top of the point cloud, this kind of graph I was, I was introducing before. Well, the first type of graph I'm going to be introducing is the mapper graph. The mapper graph is a TDA tool that has been so extensively used uh, by people um, applying uh, topology to the data analysis. So I've chosen this, this, um, this plot that I think that summarizes quite well how the mapper graphs uh, work. So the, we will start with the point cloud here and the choice of a distance. And we will choose the first thing to, to, do, to draw the mapper graph, we will choose a filter function that is uh, um, usually also called the lens function. And this function is uh, assigning a, a real number to each data point in our point cloud. So, for example, in this example, my, the F function is assigning to each of the data points the uh, Y coordinate. So, the image for my F function, by this continuous function, is ranging from 0 to 5. Okay. Um, this is basically used for dimensionality reduction. So, what I'm doing with my data set is actually projecting my data set on the Y coordinate. Okay, the second step uh, for building my mapper graph is to choose what is called a cover. A cover for the filter function. Well, a cover for an interval A to B is a collection of overlapping sets such that each of the numbers here belongs to at least one set. Okay, and they, the, this gra these um, intervals as I've said are overlapping. And the percentage of overlapping is something that can be defined and, and, and choose by the user. And it's called uh, the gain value. This is something we need to tune when we run the, the mapper graph. The third step of the graph is, well, when, once we have all the data in these beams here, we apply a clustering step within each of the beams. Okay? This step is defining, basically, the geometric scale of the shape. That, that is going to be defined uh, in the mapper graph, actually by the number of clusters that we are going to be finding on each of the bins. So this is a step that is adding precision to the groups that we are forming. And finally, we draw what is the mapper network graph that is generated by plotting the clusters within each of the bins as the graph nodes. When we see that one node, this is a, a number of cases from here that are collapsed in one node. And when we see that one node is connected with an edge to another node, this is showing that these two nodes, for example, the yellow node and the green node, are sharing individuals. As we can see here, because of the overlap between U1 and U2, there are a set of individuals that are selected in both uh, covers, right? So this is why uh, some people from here are also here. So this is a continuum. This is not like in clustering that we break up things, uh, but th these, these both are sharing individuals, okay? But for example, the green and the blue one are not sharing individuals because as you can see in this bin, 
these individuals are in one side and these others are on the other side, but there's, there's no connection between them here. So this is why in the mapper graph, there is no edge connecting these two nodes. Um, and what else? Well, we don't have the mapper graph. What we can do with that? Well, let's go back and let's go have a look to one of the, of the studies uh, we were introducing at the starting of the talk, uh, the one that uh, was entitled Using Multidimensional Topological Data Analysis to Identify Traits of Hip Osteoarthritis. So in this study, remember, they were using uh, longitudinal data for comparison of 102 subjects with and without radiographic signs of hip osteoarthritis. They had uh, multidimensional data, many um, predictors, including cartilage composition, bone shape, a classification of osteoarthritis, uh, and another scoring also using um, um, MRI and also image, image techniques and, and other, uh, other variables and scores. And they used the TDA mapper uh, to simultaneously analyze this imaging and gait uh, data. So the results that they got with from the mapper were this one, the, the ones I'm showing. So this is the network that mapper uh, generated. Mapper produces a network that was showing a clear separation between subpopulations. Uh, these subpopulations were inspected by means of a univariate test, the Komogorov Smirnov test. And, and there were two subnetworks that were already known, uh, two subnetworks that uh, were defined because of the data and that uh, the researchers already, or, already knew about them. Let's say the most diverse group and the most healthy group. So the most diverse group was defined uh, by subjects with radiographic uh, OA, these are the red nodes, this is the subnetwork that is shown on the top. Of the, of the mapper network in the upper region. And these people were showing uh, an increased cartilage score, increased classification, and older age. And the, the third subnetwork was the most healthy group people. So these capsules uh, were, were not showing any, any OA, were without OA, and they showed intact cartilage and, and less pain. But there was a new phenotype discovered that, that was interesting because this, this was form of patients in between these two groups, and they were showing a range of symptoms, a combination of symptoms. And what the researchers found was that the knee biomechanics uh, was uh, the top um, feature, uh, the top variable in discriminating this um, part of the subnetwork against the rest of the, of the sample. So that was identified as an initial marker of the disease. And the interesting thing is that this noticeable before the morphological progression and the, gener the generation of the disease and the, of the disease. Also, authors uh, had a closer group to this to this uh, subnetwork and found that there were two other subnetworks as well of interest. And uh, one of them uh, made of the high symptomatic progression people and another made of the high compositional progression. So the mapper network uh, was uh, was throwing this uh, this this new phenotype in the study. Um, you will be thinking, oh, maybe using any other clustering techniques, I would get to the same results. Maybe you would. But I still I think that uh, this uh, technique, the mapper, the mapper method, is throwing some, some, some novelties from the visualization. I think that the uh, mapper allows to visualize patients' conditions but as a continuum in the disease space. So by coloring nodes and edges, uh, by by um, by any value that you like, any variable of interest, you can always um, color your 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 graph and see if there are specific uh, topological features or areas in the graph that are uh, collapsing people, and then you can describe more uh, in more detail these people and try to understand why they are laying together in this part of your graph. And you can depict temporal phenotypes and progression of diseases. And, and I think that mapping is different from traditional clustering because it can really effectively represent continuous variation. And this is avoiding the need of, of other clustering methods of break, breaking things apart. Even sometimes we know that data belong together. I think this can be particularly problematic in data sets that we know that contain progressions or where data are naturally connected. Uh, for example, repeated observations for, from electronic health records. Uh, I really think that this, is, this clustering is bringing additional information to the usual clustering, also because we are not just focusing on people that is collapsed by the, by the um, clustering method. Normally, uh, we, we, we don't talk that way, but we are 
normally clustering methods are just fo um, focusing on, on connected components, but we are not looking at, at, at uh, people that are laying around a, a, a circle or a, or a void, for example, or they defending flares. And uh, the hypothesis here is that the um, individuals that are forming these specific topological features uh, are there because of something, so they are sharing um, um, common properties. And also mapper, I think that can be interesting as a feature selection method because each variable on data can be evaluated on its ability to discriminate, discriminate the subpopulations that we can identify in the graph. And about mapper, we can say that there are some limitations and important limitations. There are many choices, many choices to do. So we need to choose the filter function. We need to choose the gain, the resolution, the machine learning algorithm we are going to be using. Normally, the best mapper graph is usually chosen visually or manually, uh, and, and so some implementations are not relying on a statistical significant topological feature. And so it happens that most commonly, mapper is a tool that is being used as an exploratory tool rather than a confirmatory tool. And if you want to use a mapper, you will need to pay or rely in the open libraries that most recently has been developed because the most important program is the YASI, which is a commercial one. It's been distributed uh, in Silicon Valley by Gunnar Carlson, obviously. But there are other very interesting libraries uh, in Python and, and R and are in, a, in, in continuous de development and improvement, like Guti, for example, which is developed by some of, my, of our collaborators. And also very interesting is the TDA package in R. Our, our current work actually is seeking to improve uh, some of these uh, limitations of Mapper. So with E1, we are developing a pipeline that is trying to improve basically three things. First, the tuning. So we are trying to avoid the, to, to select the Mapper uh, manually. We are tuning Mapper parameters automatically, seeking to maximize the subgroup separations based on an outcome of interest of our variable of interest. We are also focusing on improving the stability. So we are only focusing on a statistically significant topological features and by means of the different definitions of distance and bootstrapping. So this way we are moving mapper to be exploratory, to be confirmatory. And we are also improving the predictive interpretability of the mapper because, uh, as I've said before, these SAP networks were um, uh, inspected using univariate tests normally, usually in the literature so far. And what we are doing is actually adding a multivariate XGBoost model uh, that can help us inspect these clusters, the cluster composition, but also to estimate the predictive power, the predictive accuracy um, to um, predict the build, um, the belong, belonging to this, the, each of the cluster um, and, and not to the rest of the sample using the predictive model. Uh, so the, we, we are and in the moment working in these publications to get it published and, and the name of, the, of our paper is a pipeline to identify homogeneous subgroups of patients and related important features using topological data analysis integrated with machine learning. Um, we obviously are also using this to analyze our data sets and so we are at the moment using this pipeline to investigate uh, how clinical and biological measurements can be useful to identify homogeneous groups of responders to antidepressant drugs. Uh, this is a work I've been working uh, for a long time, uh, involving data from the GenDep study, and now also adding study to our analysis. And so this is ongoing work, and I hope to have results very soon uh, to be shared in these meetings. Well, this is uh, about Mapper. I was promising you that I would introduce the persistent homology, and this is what I'm going to be doing now. Let's imagine now that you have this plot. This is your point cloud of data. And let's consider now a ball of radius alpha that is centered on each of the points. Okay, this is completely different. This is completely independent from Mapper. Okay, we start from scratch again, and this is a, an alternative way of building a graph and of inspecting topological features in a point cloud data. So now for each pair of balls intersecting, we are going to connect the dots with an H. And every time we have three balls intersecting pairwise, there's no need that all the balls intersect, but the three of them are in intersecting pairwise. We are going to fill it with a triangle. Okay? 
when we do have four balls intersecting pairwise, we are going to build on top of it a tetrahedron, a tetrahedron, and so on. This is a way to build a kind of graph that is called a simplicial complex. In that case, specifically, there is the check complex, but there are many others. But the idea is that we build these balls, um, um, uh, center it on each of the points, and then connect dots in that way. So for alpha equal to 0 0.5, for this specific radius, we have that there are 16 connected components here in our data set. You can count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, okay, up to 16. You can see that there is one loop. This is one loop that is emerging here. And then two-dimensional cavities. And what happens now if we move our radius and we increase our radius in a continuous, uh, in a, of, on a continuum of possible alpha values? So we get this. So we move our, uh, we range our radius from alpha equal to 0 0.3 to alpha equal to 3. And this is what happens. So for example, let's focus on this hole here that appeared for radius 0 0.5. If we move, we increase and increase. Oh, when we get to alpha 1.1, we see that the hole is not there anymore. So it does disappear, right? Okay. So let's track this. So this is actually tracking a topological feature. We are tracking a hole, a one-dimensional hole, right? So we can track the place or the moment of uh, being born here, this is the birth time, and this is the birth time for this topological feature in our data set. And then we can go to a set diagram, two-dimensional diagram, and we can plot the diameter for birth and the diameter for death in the x-axis and y-axis. So that this red point is actually encapsulating the information that this hole was being born in diameter 1 and was dead, was dying in diameter 2.2. I can do this for any dimension topological feature. I can do this for holes. I can do this for connected components. I can do this for cavities and so on. So we can get a persistence diagram to describe any kind of topological feature. So what we do with this now? Okay, so we do have a data set. We, um, we estimate the persistence diagram by considering a complex and a range of radiuses for each of the balls. And what happens when we see how we interpret this? Well, the points that are close to the diagonal are artifacts, really, because are uh, topological features that are appearing and that are dying very, very soon. So these are considered to be noise artifacts of our data set because they are very short lifetime. They have very short lifetime. But the points that are far away from the diagonal, these topological features are considered more robust because they are showing a long lifetime across uh, this range of different radius. And, and there are other things we can do with the persistence diagram, actually. We can, say, uh, we can measure uh, if we have two data sets we can estimate the persistence diagram and we can compare if the persistence diagram are similar or not. And we can do this by using what is called the bottleneck distance. This way, we can, for example, see that the persistence diagrams are, st are stable. So, for example, um, if we are given a data set that is infected only by a little noise, our persistence diagram it's going to be approximately correct because it is very close to the diagram we would get from the noisy free data. And this is because um, the distance, we know that there is a stability result that say that the distance between two persistence diagrams is bounded and it cannot be larger than the distance between the two data sets. So all of this is just to, is to show you and for you to know that um, there is some the result of stability behind in the background of these methods. And so that we built this uh, persistence diagram is robust, even if we change or we modify a little bit our data set. And this uh, is interesting because using a bootstrap approach and the bottleneck distance, we can build confidence bands, confidence in that to, and plot them in our diagrams. So for example, you can see here that by using the distance and the bootstrap and a bootstrap approach, we could build this a band, 95% confident band, so that the topological features that were laying within the band 
what's considered non-significant topological features, but the rest of them that are far away from the diagonal and outside the confidence band are considered significant. Okay, you will say, oh Raquel, that's very nice. I don't have a persistent diagram. I know which component or which hole is uh, statistically significant, but what I'm doing with this now. Okay, so well, all this information can be included in models for supervised learning. This information can complement the predictive models. Let's see how we can do that. So in principle, uh, machine learning does not apply to the space of persistent diagrams. I cannot take a persistent diagram directly and introduce it as a variable in a model. It cannot be done because persistent diagrams is not a Hilbert space. So um, what we need to do is to vectorize the persistent diagram. This is to convert the information from the persistent diagram in a, let's say, real number that I can introduce in my predictive model. So the persistence landscape, landscape is one way of doing so. There are many others. I think that, that this was one of the first ones introduced by Bubernik in 2015. And, but there are many others that even improve and they are, that are, that are more, uh, sort of more optimal than the persistent landscape. But still the persistent landscape is a method that you can always try and that it, it could can throw better, better good results as well. Um, so how is it built? So basically, uh, the persistent landscape is formed by tenting the significant points on the persistence diagram. So if, let's imagine this is your persistence diagram on the, on the left hand. Uh, and so you have three, um, let's say these are connected components. I don't know now, it's just an example. So the three blue points are three connected components that were dying, being born here and dying here, right? The three points, good. So what we do is tenting this, and then we put we, we put it on, on, on the other side, like horizontal here, and we can see that um, the blue the blue landscape is the first landscape, which is called the lambda one, and then this other line, which is red, is the lambda two, is gonna be the second landscape, and the orange one, lambda three, is the third landscape for this example. What we do with the landscape now? Well, we can discretize them. Or a number of points. This is actually selecting a discrete grid of values on the x-axis and we compute the corresponding y value for each landscape. So we create new variables and these variables now yes they can be introduced as predictors in a prediction model. I know this might sound uh, complicated but it's quite effective to capture trajectories in, in, in samples. And I'm gonna be showing an example of that now. Um, this is uh, data from the classification for, for sensor, um, for the, sorry, for the three workers experiment. And the data was uh, collected through sensor data. Uh, and for three workers, named A, B, and C, and the 3D acceleration was collected using uh, the sensor of a smartphone. Then for all of, for each of them, we got a, a very long time series that was generated for each worker. And then for each of them, we extract, extract 100 time series. Each time series was made of 200 consecutive points. If you want more detail, specifically, we were selecting 25 random sequences of eight seconds. So in total, we did have 300 time series generated in total, and for each time series, each time series is formed of 200 time points. So what we did, exactly what I just presented, we, I, we, what we did, well, I, I have run the, the example, but it's not mine really, it's from some of our collaborators, Fred and, and, and Bertrand. But uh, what they did, a complex, they considered a complex on top of the data for each single time series and each single walker. Then they considered two persistent diagrams, one for the connected components on the complex and another for the holes that appeared and disappeared. Hmm? And then from these two persistent diagrams, they built the persistent landscape like this before. Mm -hmm. They tented all the points and they considered the different colored landscapes, as you can see in figure one. Then each persistent landscape was discretized on 1,000 points. And then the first three landscapes were selected and each time series was finally described using 6,000 topological variables. 
Then these 6,000 topological variables were used to fed a random forest model that was just used to predict the world classes A, B, or C from these 6,000 features. Um, the um, method of, of, of um, validating uh, of, of, or testing was quite uh, standard, not, not the perfect one, but they just split into train and test data sets at random several times, and they could see that the average classification accuracy was around 0.95. But this is a kind of simple example for you to see how you can use a persistent landscape flowchart. Uh, if you want to see it in more detail, to retain a little bit the steps uh, we've done, is this a uh, points cloud for each single individual is uh, considered. Then you build a complex on top of the data. You produce independent persistence diagrams for different types of topological feature. Then you build the persistence landscapes, you discretize, and then you include the variables as predictors. This is exactly that what was done in this in this study on gene expression data that I mentioned at the starting of the talk, and they were considering the combination of the persistent homology and the persistent landscape and a convolu convolutional neural neural network. And they compared, uh, this was used, sorry, to predict um, um, Parkinson disease in 254 uh, cases and 161 controls. And they compared the TDA approach uh, against a support vector machine and random forest, sorry, and a simple neural network. And uh, the TDA plus CNN approach was improving uh, results and in inaccuracy against the rest of methods. Our ongoing work is also using persistent homology. Uh, so we are using exactly the, the analysis I just I just shown um, and to predict response to antidepressant treatment and using clinical measures and biological variables in gen depth and study. And it's been interesting. We have just uh, finished the analysis on, on clinical data. And this is allowing us to involve a number of repeated measures in our analysis and the results be quite positive and in improving um, the accuracy of, of, of predicting the response to antidepressants. Uh, but we are still aiming now to add uh, biological variables and see if we can even improve more of our results. And as I said, later in the year we will be uh, presenting these results in more detail. So in summary, I think that MAPPER can bring new insights to the current clustering and visualization tools. I think that is um, it's very simple, it's easy to interpret, and is responding to this current compelling challenge of uh, translating research results into transparent and accessible tools based on data visualization and interactive data exploration. It's something we are all behind. Uh, and, and also think that the topological summaries that are derived from persistent diagrams and landscapes uh, are showing promising results, and that it can be um, very um, helpful or interesting to improve results when included in machine learning predictive models. I just I just read a, a sentence the other day in this in this publication in the International Journal of Applied Engineering Research, and that the authors were saying machine learning works magically with topological data analysis. Maybe that's a, a bit exaggerated, but still I think that there's a lot of, of hope in this method and they are very, very promising, so worth trying them. Thanks very much, I told you for listening. I hope you are still awake. And I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the people that introduced me when I was very young to the field of topology. They were Carla Soto, Samuel, Natalia Castellana, Alberri, and Jaume Aguadem. To my team and collaborators, uh, Iwan, Guillan, Mathieu, Fred, Bertrand, and Naya, and to Rudolf for helping always with gender data and clinical um, explanations, and to Catherine and Peter that always support my crazy ideas. Thanks very much. Questions? Thanks a lot. There you go. Thank you very much. Almost, almost, almost out of time, really. 56. <laughs> Lot of stuff. So, is that is it similar to what you were meaning in the starting of the talk? You have talk? to stop sharing, Raquel. Sorry? You have to stop sharing. Okay, well, sorry. I think right. maybe you can keep the slides, though, actually. Well, it's up okay. to you. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sharing again, Vedri. So. Uh, yes, yeah. let's see.
Well, thank you very much, Raquel, for, for a great talk. I mean, uh, I thought in line with your last slide there, when you were talking about magic, how the magical uh, uh, sort of marriage between machine learning and the and the topology. I mean, I think this is really a case where uh, you've showed the power of mathematics, uh, <laughs> not not just <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> you're you're a math mathematician, I guess. Uh, so, um, if you could go back to Mapper, uh, the the slide on the Mapper graph. I, I particularly have quite a few questions there. If if you don't mind, that would be no, great. Maybe. So, so Zedric, is the, um, the, um, the slide when I when I'm showing the method right here? The one? map, yes, okay, yes. 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 Excellent. Yeah, tell me. You okay, can see. it's a bit yeah. slow. Yeah, that yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um I mean, I think my question there was so because uh, the covering is distinct from the connected component. So it's it seems that the covering there, although in this example could be almost unique, but I imagine that in more complex situations, you could have many different coverings, especially if you're allowing for overlap between the different open components. Op open, I mean the covers uh, mm -hmm. between each of the use. So mm -hmm. if if you have um, so how the fact that it's non-unique obviously will have uh, which if you choose just one possible covering this would have an impact on the rest of the analysis so mm -hmm. how do you determine this really yes you are totally right and it's just not just about the cover it's about any of the choices that you do on the map it's having a very big impact on the on the, um, the graph that you generate actually and some of them even if you change the cover are going to be very similar or i'm not going to be showing you groups that are differed a lot uh, between them but the, but the, the general um, message is that it's not unique. The mapper graph is not unique. You need to look for the optimal graph for your interest. So depending on what you want to emphasize on your data, because also, for example, the lens function, it's also something that you just uh, select. And you select this in terms of, what, well, of, in terms of whatever you are interested on in highlighting in your data. You can say, oh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because it's the lens through you, to the one you look to your data. You can say, I'm gonna look to my data um, through the outcome of variables, for example. And you can select the, the covers and just um, thinking on this, what intervals make sense to my, to my outcome variables, for example, if your filter is the outcome. So it's always very, 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 um, I don't want, so, so far has been quite handmade. What we, even we are trying to do is to automatize this so yeah. that we, we actually um, put a, a grid of different covers. They are always uh, intervals, right? The covers or hypercubes, of course, yeah. when, we go, when we go to, you go to higher dimensions. But yeah. what we do actually is the gain and the, and the, um, and the cover actually, the resolution is being uh, like tested in a very, very, very big range of values. And then yeah. we select the one that is uh, separating better our clusters in terms of an outcome variable and in terms of something of your interest. So it's fun. You can customize it quite, uh, quite well. Mm -hmm. But but I'm I'm correct that the the uh, the upper, the cover should be distinct from the components. But in this example, it looks like the cover, whatever the covers you're choosing is sort of going to be uh, very close to the final connected components you're identifying. And I think yeah. this is especially that relationship that I feel yeah. is, is, is because the cover mathematically, when we are looking at an object like a torus, really the covering should just be a very abstract, infinite way of defining, in a sense, the shape of the object. Mm -hmm. But here in this case, because we are dealing with finite data uh, objects, it's uh, the covering we choose then we'd have a, an impact on the, or, and it seems that maybe some of the covers will precisely be the components the connected components yeah. it might be and it also depends on how big is the overlap it's actually the overlap because yeah. the overlap is is, is 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 what is really defining how many individuals are duplicated because yeah. they are on one component and in the other so this is not the same. So these are not really the components because you have duplicated individuals, you see? So there are the same person are in the yellow and in the green nodes in the graph. So this is, the, this is a continuum. And another thing that I'm, I'm 
I'm missing here because this is a very simple example. And I'm just, and you are right, I'm just collapsing the, comp the connected component. But if I do, a, so the, you see in the step three, that is said, a clustering step is carried out within each of these bins. It really hasn't been done here. I'm just collapsing everyone in one connected component, in one node. But if I do here a machine learning um, clustering algorithm, I might find here a very, a, a, another shape. So the, it might be form of three nodes or four nodes. Or a, or it might be a cycle or, or any other thing here, or any other shape. You see, so this is why I'm saying that this step is defining the geometric scale. Here, as you said, there's not really geometric scale, so everyone is put together in one node. There's no precision here in the group. So everything is collapsed in one node, just because the example is very simple. But in other examples here, we, we can move the resolution, and because of the cover, you write, and we can try to find a little bit more detail and understanding a little bit better the data, the, the shape within each bin. Thank you, thank you, Ronica. I mean, I would have many, many more questions, but I think I'll, I'll leave the floor to to someone else. <laughs> thank you. We can talk. We can talk yes. with you. Thank you, in the, in the chat room, so I think we should ask them because they're for external. So Nicole wants to know how would you use persistence landscape in combination of machine learning for imaging data. So Nicole Busula, I mean, perhaps mm -hmm. you want. Yes, I haven't. I have specifically with imaging data, but I would say that if you can plot your data uh, and you can plot the data and you can see your, you can get your point cloud and define a metric that can work for your imaging data. But this is important. I'm not, uh, I'm not talking too much about metric uh, selection, but you can, for example, uh, build a metric that is uh, meaningful to your imaging data. And then you can, from here, build your persistent diagrams and your, from the persistent diagram, build the persistent landscape. I cannot see much more uh, difference uh, in, in terms of, of data structure to be able to, to build the, the, the persistent landscape because if you see, I was showing at least for the mapper for sure because it was including imaging data, the example that I was showing. So you can use the mapper for imaging data. And I'm almost sure you can do that with the same. I have no experience with imaging data, as I said. But I assume you might be able to produce the point, the point cloud and the complexes on top of it. I could look for literature if you're interested in me. Thank you. Did it answer your question, Nicole? Hi, sorry, can, can I talk? Yes. Okay. yes talk. okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, maybe because I was wondering the problem uh, I'm dealing with, I'm working mainly with images. Yeah. And so the problem is uh, the embedding is uh, really high dimensional. So I usually have to use something else like UMAP, for example. Mm -hmm. And then on th that data point, I maybe could use the persistent landscape. Mm -hmm. Think? I think you should be able. It is very, very, very high dimensional. Uh, one of the problems that TDA is suffering, of course, is because of the combinational approach. Uh, so it, it is very heavy in high dimension. So it can be very time consuming and, and it can give you some problems. But um, there is specific software at the moment uh, being developed to deal with very high dimensional problems that you could try. And also, I see that my postdoc even is sharing um, a paper in this moment on how to use uh, topological data analysis of high resolution diabetic retinopathy images. And so, since that they were using also persistent homology. So, you could have a look to this as well. It is, I mean, very interested in your, in your example, actually. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. If Katarina had a question, are you? You want to ask it, Eva, Katarina? I can, I can read it. If not, it's fine. Yes. I can ask it as well. That's okay. okay. Yeah. That's okay. I'm just interested in um, how, when preparing, um, when preparing the persistence measures for inclusion in the CNN, would you also convert them into a persistent lands persistence landscape, or would that be different from uh, what you showed with the random forests? Um, I'm asking you, do you have repeated measures for each of your individuals in the sample size? So you are able to build a data matrix for each of your, of your subjects? 
Um, sorry, I don't. I don't think I heard you properly because I think there's some feedback. Sorry. Some audio feedback. Uh, so no, I was just asking you if you do have repeated measures for each of your of your individuals in the sample, or you, do you have only one data set for everyone with no repeated measures? Just one time point. Okay, so that's going to be can be problematic because for persistent landscapes and and, and persistent homology, uh, you would need to get a data matrix for each individual. Because what we get is a, um, a description of topological features by individual, not for the whole data set. So if you don't have repeated measures, uh, you would need to think in a way so that you can... So for example, for gene expression, you, we work with co-expression networks so that we can get a matrix for each individual. So in your case, I have I have a, I have an work with here and, then, and persistent homology, but the first thing I would do probably would be to use mapper instead. And and I could see from the subgroups in mapper you can you can infer a, a phenotype that can be of, of use for you. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Raquel, just to add to that. So I don't think there's any uh, reason why you couldn't um, either, it, well, you mentioned your question. Um, I, th I think the real sort of challenge uh, that Raquel talked about during the talk was taking the persistence landscapes and turning them into something useful for your uh, neural network. So um, the, the the approach that we've used so far is sort of this discretization where you take the persistence landscape and essentially convert it into variables that we can input into a prediction model. Um, but so long as you can get the prediction landscape, there's no um, there's no reason why that shouldn't be possible. But to derive the persistent diagram, uh, you just do one persistent diagram for the whole data set, then you, you cannot convert it in, in data to yes. include in the, you know, yes. in, the, in the models. So you would need to get a set of data for each of the individuals. So. Yeah. Okay. You want to ask you the final question from Ewan? Or you? <laughs> this is, this is a yeah, Ewan, Ewan is not meeting. having questions to me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question really just to sort of I think when, when you when you see these ideas presented and if you're well when I was looking at them for the first time it's it's incredibly abstract and quite hard to connect what we've seen with what we're maybe more used to seeing uh, in sort of psychiatry and prediction modeling more generally um, and I think certainly some types of data will be more suitable for TDA than others um, so that's that was one query sort of question. Uh, and the other um, that I, it's sort of how would you know? Um, we've talked about different shapes and sort of donuts and cups and things, well, just donuts. Um, how do we know what to look for? Rather, how do we know? So I have some data. What should my expectation be about the data? And I think the, the example that uh, I really like that I find intuitive is the three walkers, because I think of those people walking as sort of, they have a gait or they have some sort of characteristic about their walk, which leads to uh, sort of interest, you know, shapes and topology in that, da in that data. But in other data sets, I, I have no idea as to what I should expect. Is there anything that like we can say that um, either with regard to gender, either with the sort of which data sets would, be, would work well with this or also how should we think about topology in terms of our expectations when we look at our data? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that things are going to be coming more, like more interesting uh, as more people run these models in biological measures, in, involving biological data. So we will have more examples of what we can get. But you're right, because we're probably some of the first ones in running these methods in biological measures in psychiatry. And so we are quite blind to what, what are the... So, so we had the intuition that this can improve those because we can see other data set that uh, where intuitions works better, as you said, as the three workers, that there are improvements and that make a lot of sense. And we need to understand what is a trajectory here, for example. But the trajectory of a worker can be the trajectory of a disease, for example. And so um, I think that we, 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 we need to start to look at data like, like this, trying to, to understand it from a more like a standard... Yeah. I think. Okay. 
Thanks a lot. Okay, for this really interesting, exciting talk. I'm looking forward to Ewan's or Union's presentation in a few weeks. Or, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for attending. I just I already Thank mentioned it in the chat box. The next meeting is on the 17th of February, where Professor Andreas Kroll from the University of Dortmund presents about his work about regularized Cox reality models. So these are basically uh, lasso Cox models with random effects. So that should be a really interesting presentation. And so I hope that we see you there. Yeah. OK, then. Thanks a lot, every. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. I hope to see everybody soon again.